Hi, my name is Jan Cha. I'm a physician and the global healthcare leader for Automation Anywhere, which is a leading cloud-native intelligent automation platform. My topic today is, is there a bot or software robot in your future? And to look into this question of uh, the future of healthcare, let's take a look in the past uh, and ask the question, why do people go into healthcare? Uh, here are a number of reasons that uh, people want to get into healthcare. Uh, delivering compassionate care, intellectually challenging work, uh, being able to keep on top of a, a very complex and very um, technology-driven field, using creativity to solve problems. These are things that draw people to this area, and uh, it's very understandable why they want to enter this very noble profession and do these things. But I think today in healthcare, there are other things that need to be done, uh, and so let me show you a few of those. We have things that involve tedious um, messaging and uh, data entry and e-work, things that require a lot of data management, multiple data sources, uh, documenting your actions, every action to be compliant, sending re reminders to patients, and analyzing data and, and uh, creating reports for your organization. These are things that are important as well, especially in a data-driven world. So let's look at these two sets of data. The first set is what I would call the clinical set. High value in your efforts requires a lot of training, expertise, and experience, sometimes years of experience. Uh, requires a lot of social skills, empathy, uh, creativity. Uh, patient diversity requires you to do very good exception handling. Of course, very intellectually engaging. And the goals are to improve health and to save lives. And this is obviously very deeply rewarding. On the other hand, if you look at the other set of uh, activities that people have to do, data entry, these are all low value of effort. Manual rules-based tasks that are very tedious and boring, error prone. And here the goals are speed and accuracy and timeliness. And these are things that are more suitable for machine uh, machines to do. The data entry burden on this side, the administrative burden, causes tremendous job stress and in fact has been shown to contribute to burnout of um, healthcare personnel. So how can an organization optimize its resources? I think the logical answer is to let the humans do what the humans do best. Let the machines do what the machines do best. And this obviously brings up the issue of automation. But before we look at what automation can do, let's uh, define a few terms. Here are four terms that are very common. The first is RPA, or Robotic Process Automation. Here is where a bot can copy or replicate what a human being does at the keyboard and the mouse. Uh, it's a manual, repetitive, rules-based kind of action, very amenable for bots. The next uh, one is Intelligent or Cognitive RPA, where we incorporate, the bot incorporates computer vision, natural language processing, machine learning, and so on, to do more sophisticated kinds of automation. Then there's unattended automation, which is a bot that runs by itself, 24 by 7 by 365 if desired, without much supervision. And finally, there's the attended automation bot. The bot stands by as an intelligent assistant with a repertoire of activities and capabilities that you can draw upon as a human worker. And the ideal situation would be in the contact center, for instance, where it can help the agent perform a lot of things while the agent is able to talk to the patient and uh, give the patient a much more satisfactory experience. What kind of process is ideal for automation? Any action that is driven by the screen, keyboard, and mouse, anything that's uh, manual and repetitive, rules-based, tedious, boring, prone to error, uh, high volume, because high volume leads to high return. Uh, process usually needs to be well-defined or well-understood. Uh, readable data types, low exception rates, and limited human decision making. And last but not least, it should be measurable because you need to prove the benefit of automation. There should be some way to, to uh, measure its output or its effect on the process. These are some of the things that you can actually do with automation. For instance, you can transfer data between systems, read and write. You can analyze data to populate dashboards and reports. You can trigger actions based on business rules or hide complex processes behind uh, simple UIs. 
You can do process discovery to find out what your process actually involves just by watching the people that are doing it. You can integrate and interoperate between IT systems. You can audit. You can create a very granular audit trails. And then you can enable AI-powered workflows with machine learning that actually improve over time. So the goals of automation traditionally have been five. This has been the need to gain greater capacity, speed, accuracy, productivity, and cost savings. But with the advent of intelligent automation, uh, now people are looking at scalability in the healthcare context, especially with the pandemic. Interoperability between incompatible systems, uh, the ability to manage risk. Healthcare is fully regulated from top to bottom, and actually a bot can be used to monitor what's going on, who's doing what, what permission they had, what decisions they made, and what the outcomes were. So it's very useful for that and even for enforcing protocols. And finally, analytics, uh, the ability to look across different systems, which was very difficult in healthcare before because of silos, to get a comprehensive or holistic picture of the organization, or even just to track, for instance, value delivered across the organization and across different functions. Here's a heat map of uh, potential areas for automation. Orange is high potential. Uh, yellow is medium, gray is low, and I've divided providers into three sections, clinical operations, business operations, and operation support with different functions under each uh, division. So if you look at this map, uh, a lot of orange areas show up under business operations. This is where organizations are finding the lowest hanging fruit. And if you notice, notice the, um, the, the number of boxes that are below the revenue cycle uh, use case, this is where most people are starting because of the, uh, the number and uh, extent of processes that can be automated and the ability to achieve very fast ROI, very, very immediate ROI. The interesting thing is that uh, this is a picture of colors that will change as an organization gets uh, more mature in automation. They'll start to look at more complex processes. And in fact, uh, we've had some organizations go into the clinical area such as the NHS in the UK that is now automating the checking of oxygen tank levels because of COVID-19. Uh, that freed up about 4,000 hours of nurse time and think of the impact of that amount of time on patient care. It's pretty staggering. Here's the outpatient revenue cycle as an example of a use case. I'll show you three of them. This one, of course, uh, probably something you're very familiar with. It takes it follows the patient journey from pre-registration all the way to the billing statement and follow-up and encompasses a lot of major areas like prior authorization, denials management, claim submission, and so on and so forth. Um, you're probably very familiar. This is, a, this is a very complex area, lots of steps beneath each of these boxes. The orange boxes are where people have found uh, it beneficial to automate. And the yellow arrow points to a loop that is a denial loop for claims that could be automated uh, in two aspects. One is that you can submit claims that are more accurate and more complete, and therefore have a higher approval rate from the payer. But also the claims that come back, you can analyze to see what kinds of claims a specific payer would tend to reject. And so you get some idea of how to optimize your claims as well as optimizing the denial management loop so that you can actually make it cheaper to reprocess those claims. Uh, the cost of reprocessing a rejected claim is about $118 versus only $10 or $15 to submit that claim. Next we have telemedicine, which was brought on by COVID-19 uh, in a very disruptive way. If you look at this process, it very much resembles a clinic visit from registration to coverage verification and so on and so forth. Uh, there are two aspects I want to mention. One is that when people started to, to use telemedicine, um, they had to uh, work with their configuration. That is, now you had uh, hundreds of uh, hundreds of patients, each with a different setup at home, trying to do telemedicine. And so you had to automate in order to do this securely and in a very consistent way to automate this process so that it's seamless for physician and patient. And so there was some interest in automating the setup for telemedicine. 
uh, because you think about it, telemedicine can increase your um, hacker attack surface tremendously. So that's one thing. The second aspect is actually that people are now using remote sensor data. They're using remote um, monitoring equipment for vital signs and other things. And so this data that comes over from the uh, remote site is often uh, hard to reconcile with uh, your basic electronic health record. It's not a trivial process. So automation can help, of course, to curate that data, to convert it, to make it compatible with the EHR data, and to even uh, insert it into the record uh, in, a, in a way that's acceptable so that it can be used by the physician in the future. Finally, we have the EHR itself, and this is a very interesting area. We're seeing a lot of uh, progress in the last couple of years. EHR, of course, is the core mission-critical system for most healthcare organizations, and most EHR packages have some level of automation inside them, and uh, this is very useful, but it tends to be very rudimentary. We've heard from a lot of organizations that they want more, more sophisticated automation. And so you can use a platform like, like ours, even on top of the electronic health record to automate. But this, the, the, the greatest amount of value, I think, is in automating between systems, between the EHR and other kinds of systems like bed control, uh, visiting nurse association, uh, uh, visiting nurse systems, uh, prescription systems, if you're, if you're using separate uh, systems. Uh, all kinds of things that can interact with the EHR in which if you can do, uh, if you can access both, will give you a much better picture of what's happening inside the organization. The great news in the last couple of years has been the 21st Century Cures Act, which Congress passed and now mandates all EHR vendors to uh, meet the goal of opening up their systems to data, to data access. Uh, I believe this is going to be required by the end of 2022 or 2023. And uh, so major vendors are starting to do this. In other words, you can now access EHR, EHR data directly. And in fact, we just announced a bot that uses the HL7 Fire API, uh, uh, which is an international standard, to access Epic's database directly without launching Epic, without launching Citrix, and with a fully Epic-sanctioned uh, modality of access. So very exciting news, uh, a space to keep watching. Uh, and uh, the goal of interoperability may actually start to become uh, real. So here are some of the ROIs that we have seen with automation, some of the benefits. Literally, organizations are saving thousands of FTE hours, FTE hours per year, uh, reducing manual effort by 90% or more, and improving productivity, typically 30 or 40% or so. Uh, they're achieving accuracy to 100% with zero errors, which is amazing, scaling to tens of thousands of processes automated concurrently or to millions of tasks automated per year. Um, when you ask organizations, what is their ROI? And we did this with a survey that we commissioned with a third party uh, across the board, vendor agnostic. The average for those uh, organizations implementing automation is 250%. That's a a staggering number of some organizations getting up as high as 380% or higher, uh, the top performers. So obviously that those kind of numbers are almost unbelievable, but they're documented and they're real. They can be achieved. So depending on the process, depending on the configuration, the individual organization, the return can be very fast and very immediate. So that's, uh, that's very encouraging and certainly gives us hope uh, for the future of healthcare as we re-engineer it so we let machines do what machines do best and humans do what humans what only humans can do. So I think that uh, the future is bright for healthcare. I think it takes uh, a bit of visionary nature in a healthcare organization to go this route, but I believe it is inevitable. Uh, healthcare is not sustainable the way it is today and we need to use technology as part of the answer to build the future of healthcare. So I thank you for your attention. I thank you for your interest. I hope you get a hold of us and we'd love to show you what our platform can do and, um, and I will certainly uh, look forward to that. Thank you very much.